what we're going to do today is basically uh, the last algorithm uh, for streaming setting. And this algorithm is for estimating the norm. Um, so I think we'll finish this today. And next class, like, uh, we will see how to apply linear sketch for graph algorithm. But today, just let's do it like another sketch. Uh, OK, so before going to this algorithm, what we're going to do is that we're going to look at one very general trick. Um, we're going to use this trick today. But I really want to talk about this trick because it's, it's just so useful beyond streaming algorithm. So as long as you use anything related to statistics, it should be useful for you. Okay. So this trick is called me median of means trick. Okay. So what is this? So suppose that you have some quality quantity Q. It's just some number that you want to know, but you don't have uh, direct access to it. But you want to know Q. Q can be, let's say, norm of something or like some number that you don't know. However, what you have with you is a random variable x. And this random variable x is such that its expectation is Q. Okay. So you don't have Q, you have x. And if expectation of x is Q, then we say that x is an unbiased estimator of q. So that's the name for it. So when you have x with you, it might be good. So at least you have some indirect access to q. But normally what we want is something much, much, much stronger than x. We want something that is called epsilon delta estimator for q. So we said z is epsilon delta estimator for q if c is basically between like within one plus epsilon factor of q with high probability. So z is like a, not too small compared to q and not too big compared to q. It's within like one plus epsilon factor. And that should happen with high probability, one minus delta. So if you have this, then you really like uh, have like a good approximation of Q, right? So this is much much stronger, like much stronger estimator than than just an unbiased estimator. So now what we hope to do is here, yeah, we hope that if you have just an unbiased estimator, we hope to like I want to tell you some easy trick to kind of boost this quality of x to get epsilon delta estimator for, okay. From just by unbiased estimator for q, we want to get epsilon delta estimator from x. And this is for q, of course. And this trick is called median of means. So let me tell you about this. So you see, like, this seems much more useful than like just streaming algorithm. This is so generic. Generic. All right. So before I tell you the trick, we just need to recall something about variance. Right. So variance of x basically measure how much x deviate from its expectation, and what the definition of it is just in expectation how much x deviate from its expectation. That's, that's what, what variant is. But another way, like if you expand the definition, then, then you get that variant is just uh, um, expectation of x square minus expectation of x, everything is square. So that's variance. And there are two like uh, basic properties of variance. That is, 
if you have a variable x, then you scale it by some scalar c. The variant of c times x is c squared times the variant of x. So that just really follow from from the from the definition of variance, right? Yeah. Also, you also have that uh, the variance of sum of xi is a sum of variance of xi. But this is true only when x are independent. Xi are independent. So you need this. If they are not independent, then, then this is not true. Then that need to be some term related to covariance. Co right? But um, this is all we need in this class. Okay. And another thing that we will use today is called Chebyshev inequality. So the proof is simple, but I will, I will not prove it. So, but what it says here, if you, you, it can of be like a, it's a concentration bound, right? It say that the probability that X deviate from its expectation by more than A, that is at most variant of X over A square. So, I guess you have seen this before, right? Uh, uh, I will just use it. Um, so it, the proof is simple from Mankhoff inequality. So you can see what's, why it's true. So that's, that's what we're going to need about variance. Okay. So now, let me describe the trick. The first thing is that Intuitively, when you like, when you want like a really good estimator of some quantity q, what you need is that it should have small variance. Right? Um, if it has really large variance, then then like uh, it shouldn't be like a very appro like accurate approximator. So when when you are given an unbiased estimator, what we want to do first is just to reduce its variance. And how do we do that? The very easy trick is just to make copies and take the average. So imagine that you have x, which is the unbiased estimator. Suppose that I just take k independent copies of x, x1 up to xk, and just compute the average of this xi. What do you think is the expectation of y? If, if like a expectation of each xi is q, what should be the expectation of y? Q. Yeah, it should be q. Like, this is so intuitive, right? Like, uh, everything on each xi like a uh, half average of q. If you take the average of xi on average, y should be q as well. So this is going to be the same as expectation of x. And what do you think is the variant of, of y? Just let me just ask this. Do you think the variant of y should stay the same as the variance of x or more or less? Yeah. Anyone? Okay, then yes. It should be less. And like, like the reason, like th this is also quite intuitive. So, uh, how should we do this? Like, if you have, mm, 
how was the intuition like? So like, if you have independent copies of of x, if you average them. Okay, good. Maybe a thing like this. Um, like think of coins, right? Uh, if you if you like uh, flip it once, um, you get zero or one, but this expectation is is half. Okay. Um, now. Uh, no, no, maybe. I'm not sure how 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 do I like explain this in an intuitive way. But if you take average of things, uh, the variance should reduce. Like, like what we will get is that the expectation of y stay the same as x, but the variance of y actually would reduce by a factor of k compared to the variance of x. And we can do we can see the calculation though, but like when I think about this, I just think about this in the intuitive way. But let's calculate, right? So how do you compute the expectation of y? Just expand the definition of y, then apply linearity of expectation. So you get that this is the sum of expectation of xi. So each expectation of xi is just expectation of x. So this is like a 1 over k times k times expectation of x. So you get this. How about variance of y? Just expand the definition of y. Look at this scale, right? This would equal to 1 over k square times the variance of this thing. Because when you scale by something, you can put the scale out and square it. So you get k square here. And then variance of the sum is the sum of the variance when x, i are independent. So you get this. Now, um, each variance of x, i is just a variance of x because x, i is just, just a copy of x. So now you get 1 over k here. So, so keep this in mind. Whenever you want to reduce a variance by a factor of k, just make k copies, k independent copies, and take the average. Okay. So now, let's say I set k to be big enough. Okay. Then I would be able to show that the, um, the probability that y deviate from q by epsilon q is at most one third. Okay. So what, what do you think, how, how should we prove this? Which inequality we should use? Inequality. Yeah, we just apply Chebyshev. Yeah. So, so k here is just said to be big enough so that you can apply Chebyshev. So let's see, right? You have this. You ask how much, what is the probability that y deviate from q by epsilon q? Apply Chebyshev here. You get variance of y over epsilon q square. But the variance of y is at most 1 over k variance of x. And let's replace q by the expectation of x. And now k is just said to be big enough so that things cancel out and you get 1, one third here. So the way you think about k is that it is of the order variance of x over expectation of x square. And then you have epsilon square here. So as long as you set the, the, the number of copies here to be this big, you can make it that this guy shouldn't deviate too much from here with um, one third probably, like at, at least 
like it deviates from Q with just one third probability. Okay. Question up to now? So now, like, you see that just by making copies and average, you can make sure that, okay, this guy should be like a within epsilon factor with like one one third probability. At most, like, it fell with one third probability. But ideally, we want this to be like, to be small, not just one third. We want this to be like delta. And delta is anything small, as, as small as you want. Okay, so we're gonna do kind of the same trick, but not average. So let's say now that you have y, which is the unbiased estimator, that just like before, we have this thing. Now, if I say that I make t independent copies of y, let's say y, 1 up to yt, and now I compute a median of y. Right. Now I claim that if you just set t to be something quite tiny, really, right? Just set t to be something like 100 log over 1 over delta, log of 1 over delta. Now you can boost the probability here from 1 third to just delta. So now the probability that z would deviate from q by more than epsilon q is at most delta. And we have seen something similar to this before, right, in class. But let me just go through it again. Um, okay. So, but you see, like, if, if we have this thing, then we are done, right? Z now is just by the definition, epsilon delta is made up for Q. All right, let's see the proof. Um, so imagine that you have like a number line and maybe Q is here, right? And then this is maybe one minus epsilon Q. This is one plus epsilon Q. And now what you do is that you make a copies of Y Let's say like you sample y, you have y, y1, y2 somewhere, maybe y3 is here. What you have is that when you make a copy of y, right, the probability that y is here in a good range here is like with probability at least two thirds. The probability that yi is outside outside this good range is at most probability one third. Okay. So if I just say that let's say that I let let i huge count the number of yi such that is yi is too big. So number of yi here is is i huge and number of yi here is called i tiny so just count the, the guys that are too big or too small it's not within a good range okay so you know that this huge guy and tiny guy in expectation there shouldn't be too much it should be just T over three, right? Because each of the guy, each of the yi fall inside this good range with probability one third. So there are t many copies of them. 
So each of them will, will be here, like with probability at most, like in expectation is just T over three. Make sense? Are you with me? Yeah. Okay. So, but now, like if you ask yourself, when will it be the case that the median, the median of y deviate from q, but like the, the median of y is outside the good range? That's, that's what I ask, right? If the median of y is outside the good range, that means that either i huge is more than, more than half of the copies, or i tiny is more than half of the copies. Okay, so, so now like we just want to say that this event, these two events shouldn't happen with, with high probability. Okay. So let's see, let's see that, let's analyze the event that I huge is more than two T or two. Well, that is at most the probability, it's just the same thing as saying that I huge is at most uh, two or three times expectation of i huge because because this is this thing is t or uh, this thing is three or three so sorry this should be this thing this should be maybe something like okay let's let me do it. Yeah, so t over two is what uh, is three over three times. Yeah, which is three over three times expectation of of i huge. So this thing should be. Yeah, sorry. Now, if you apply the chain of bound, you would get this thing, right? Just get that um, this should be ex exponentially small of minus some constant times the mean, like times the expectation of a i huge, which is at least t over 3. And you choose t to be big enough, right? t is of order, um, t is something like 100 log of 1 over delta. So t is just big enough, and this is at most delta over 2. So similarly, you would get i tiny is more than this with probability like uh, delta over two as well. Just kind of symmetric proof. And because each of each of the event here happen with probability at most delta over two. So it means that the event that Z deviate from Q by too much happen with at most delta probability just by union bound. So we get we get this thing. Question about this calculation. Is it okay? Um, is it okay? <laughs> Can you? All right. Good. Question? All right. Then I, I go on, right? Okay, so now, so you see that, if just to conclude, you see, given any unbiased estimator, x, 
what you can do is just make like a C copies where C is KT many copies. So you can of create TK many copies of X independent one, right? And then for each group of size K, you make you take the average, you get Y. So you get Y one up to Y T, and after that you just take the median and you get C. That's all we did. Yeah. That all we have done. And now you just get that Z is gonna be uh, epsilon delta estimator. When you set K and, and T to be big enough, like like we did. Okay. So that's like very simple trick, right? Just make a copies, take a mean, take a median of memes. That's it. And the moral of the story here is that, so you see, in this calculation, every, if you think of data and epsilon as a constant, this, this would be constant. This would be constant if this guy is a constant. So this would be like constant if variance x over this guy square is a constant. So it means that if whenever you have that the variance over, over expectation square is a constant, you can really, it's super easy to get uh, epsilon delta estimator, right? Just make something like constant independent copies of x and and you would get it. Just take, make these many copies and then take the, and then take the median of the means. Okay. What is going on? Okay, question up to this point. Okay. So you see, like, this is super generic trick and it should be useful for you. Okay, so now with this trick, we are ready to, to look at a new problem. And this problem is called norm estimation. Okay. Again, we are in the setting where we have data stream, we have a where we have a frequency vector x of the data stream. At each time, you can update uh, xi by some, some delta. Given i, i and delta, you update xi by delta. So that's the setting. And what we want is here, new problem. We want to create a linear sketch, sketch of x, of size, just something like constant. Um, 1 over epsilon square times log of 1 over delta. And uh, from here, from this sketch, you should be able to compute number c such that from this sketch, such that with high probability, uh, c square is within, within the 1 plus epsilon factor as the norm of x square. Basically, if you take the square root, then, then you have that this is just the norm of x. So this is why we call this problem two norm estimation. We want something that estimates the two norm of x. Okay. So basically, the absolute value of z is the great estimator for the norm, two norm of x with high probability. You don't need this, just. So that's the problem. And now, uh, let's look at the algorithm. 
So I will tell you one algorithm that will not work yet, but it can be made, like you can make it work uh, easily. So this algorithm that is not, doesn't work yet is called Tarkov War Sketch. It's an extremely simple algorithm. Okay. So what you what I would do is just I start with some initial number zero z, and then let h here be a function that map each element in n to minus one or one, and h should be four wise independent, which you will see why in the in the analysis we need this. Okay. But let's say for now it's just for y independent hashing hash function. Now, um, I said that when when you are you have an update y and delta uh, i and delta, what you do you just increase like you just update z either by plus delta or minus delta, depending on the value of h i. So if hi map to minus one, given update of delta, just reduce it by delta. Otherwise, you just increase by delta. And you can see that. So what? 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 Like z at all time is just going to be this number, right? It's just a sum over our i of h i times x i. Okay. So that's that's the only number that you maintain. And now, when someone asks for the estimation of norm square, what you return is just you return z square. Is the algorithm clear? Yeah. Ms. Berger, like, uh, like delta is like plus minus, or is it like the index? Delta is the number that you update. Like, given this, given this thing, it means that you update xi by, by delta. So delta is just some any number. Hmm? Okay. So is is it clear to you that z is just the sum of this thing, just from from the def, from how you update z? Oh, sorry, what's the deformation of xi? xi is the frequency of element i. I mean, just like in last two class, right? You you have a stream and you have a vector x. Vector x is a frequency vector. At each time, you can update a frequency of i. More question about the algorithm. Good. So you see that, like, the algorithm is called tug of war because it's like there is a pulling between one side and minus one side, right? Given any update here, like for some for some guy for some like for each element i for each element. It either pull z to the to the plus side or to the minus side, so that's why we call it tug of war. How you how do you decide which way to pull? Just do it randomly. But more precisely, like it, they are random up to like a four indices basically. It's four wise independent. And this is just an algorithm that just maintain one number, 
So it's really simple. Okay. okay, so now we are ready to analyze it. Okay, so just for simplicity, like let me use a vector g. It's a vector of dimension n. Each entry is minus 1 or 1, where gi is just gi is just hi. Okay. So when you write z, z is just the sum of xi gi. <coughs> so only gi is a random uh, variable, right? This is xi is just a number. It's not, not nothing random about it. But if you think of like what's going on, if you look at C here, at the first glance, like Z looks useless. <laughs> okay? Because if you just compute the expectation of C, right, then expand the definition of C here, apply linearity, linearity of expectation, you get that this is the sum of Xi, expectation of Gi. Now what is expectation of gi for every i? It's either 1 or minus 1 with the same probability. So that expectation of gi is just 0. Right. So this is 0, it's expectation. Why is this useful at all? Well, it turns out that it's useful because if we just look at the expectation of c square instead of c, then expectation of z square is just a norm of x square. Turns out. How come, right? Well, you just do a calculation and you 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 see. Okay. So first we have z square. And z square is just this sum and then you square thing. And what you get is that you get like a, the, square, the square term and the cross term. When you have a sum, the square of the sum, you get the square term here, and you get a cross term. The square term is just a sum over all i. Like this is like when the indices are the same. Two indices are the same, you get uh, x i square, g i square. And you need to multiply the, ter the two term whose indices are not the same. So when i and j are different, you get the sum of i not equal j, x i x j, g i g j. So nothing is going on. Just just expand this square. And now apply linearity of expectation. Right? Just put expectation inside the sum. So you get this thing and this thing. Now what is this? What is expectation of g i square? One. It's always one, right? Because you have one or minus one, its square is just always one. So that's this one. And how about expectation of g i times g j? Well, this is where we need that the function h is pairwise independent. Actually, it's fourwise independent, but in particular, it is pairwise independent. So, so this is nothing but this thing, right? Um, this and this. But this is like if you look at h i and h j. They behave like uh, independent random variables. So you can say that the expectation, expectation of the product, you can factor it out and you, you get the product of expectation here. But now, this is just, again, zero. So. This thing just gone. And you get only this part. But this is just a norm of x square. Okay. 
Good. So you see now that um, c square turns out to be the undivided estimator of norm square. Okay. So now what we want, the goal of this sketch that we want is to get epsilon delta estimator of the norm square. Right? We want this kind of thing with, with probability one minus delta. So what should we do? Yeah. We have some unbiased estimator. We want epsilon delta estimator. Anyone? Yeah. Let's do the same trick again. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's the point of the <laughs> Thanks. So just do just compute median of means. Make copies. Make copies and compute median of mean. Then you boost you boost the quality of the estimator, right? Okay, so what you do? Like you you have these variables like c square, which is estimator for norm square. So what you do is just do the do the trick here. Make k like a choose k copies here, where k here is just like variable over over expectation square times this thing. And you have you set t like before in the trick. And then you make in total k times t mini copies of Tarkov Wall sketch. And then you basically you get the, you maintain this mini z, z1 up to z c. And yeah, once you make this many copies, when you query, just return a million of memes, like we did before. You have like a copies of C I square, not just C I, not just this thing without square. Right? You like look at this guy square, and to take the average of these squares, you get this thing square, and then. Um, Take the median of all of this, then you get c square here. Okay, good. So, what you return is you just return this at the end, and this will be epsilon delta estimator. Square. Okay. So this would work like very nicely if if k here is small, right? So by the way, like you shouldn't confuse c here with with the uh, original c in talk of war. Um, maybe I should just. So that this is just some some other variables. Let's say this is just um, some number alpha. This is like alpha is just a median of average of all of this guy. Yeah. Okay. So this would work if this thing is small, right? Suppose that, and I claim that it is going to be small. It's going to be just two, actually. But if it is the case like that, then you can see that we are done, right? Because we make like a C mini copies. C is like, C is KT. K is going to be just 
uh, epsilon square, and t is just uh, log of one over delta. So you could just make this many copies of talk of war sketch. Each of the sketch takes just one number. You put it together, you, that's, that's your sketch. And that's like, when your query just return them like computer median of means. And this sketch is also linear. So we are like up to this point. We are good. We are done now. Except that we need to prove that the variance over expectation square is small. All right. So now. Let's prove it. Well, like the proof, there's nothing that is too complicated. It's kind of just calculation, but we just need to do it, right? Um, we we have this. We want to we want to show that variance over expectation square is small. So what is variance of c square? Is the expectation of c to the fourth minus expectation of c square? Everything square. And this guy, the expectation of C square, we have seen it before. We know what exactly it is. It's just norm square. So everything square here is just norm to the fourth. So all we need to do is just talk, compute the expectation of C square. Okay. So let's do it. Well, if you just write down the definition of what is c square, c z here is just the sum of g i x i. So the z square is just like this thing, and you when you apply linearity of expectation, then you get expectation inside the sum. So just really enumerate all four tuple of indices. Multiply everything together. And then you apply, you put linear expectation inside the sum, just because by linearity of expectation. Okay. Looks scary, like a bunch of indices. How do we analyze it? We need to simplify it a bit. And we know one trick so far, how to simplify things. That is, if somehow, like, you can factor this thing out so that you get some expectation of just gi times something else. If you just have one g inside expectation, that thing is zero, right? So like, well, that's what we're gonna try to do. We try to simplify it like that, so. So we ask ourselves, which term in this huge sum actually like uh, zero out? Actually, it's zero. Which term in the sum is zero? Okay. So I claim that this term is gonna be just exactly the term where one, like the term where one of the indices in i j k l appears only once. So imagine that like i is the indices that is not the same as anything else, j, k, and l. So for example, let's say i is 3, and then j might be uh, 5, k might be 6, and j, l is 5. So here is the case when i is not the same as anything else, K also is not the same as anything else. Yeah. But let's focus, let's say, focus on I here. Well, 
by four wise. This is where we need four wise independent. By four wise independent, right? We have that, like the the expectation of G i, G j, G k, G l is this thing. Because i is not the same as anything else, and there are just four indices here. So i would be like uh, behave independent, like gi would behave independently from, from all of this guy, from all other three indices. Right, because this is for y is independent. So because gi is just independent from all other g, you can factor gi out. And then, once you have factored this out, then this guy is just zero. Make sense? So this this basically kind of answer why did we use a hash function that is for wise independent? We need it here. So you can see that the only zero, the only non-zero term in this sum, in this sum, will need to correspond to a tuple i j k l such that either one index appear four times or two indices appear twice, right? Because you see that if one index appears once, you know that it must zero out. If one index appears three times, then another index would be the guy that appears just once. So, Either you appear as like a, one guy appears four times or two indices appear twice. That's when you cannot zero out. So what you get is then here, this is a case where one index appears four times, right? So you have you have that this guy. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa. You have that this guy, the sum of i, j, k, l, x, i, x, j, x, k, x, l, g, i. G, G, K, G, L. Okay. But there are only two cases where this term is non-zero. When one index appears four times, that, that's when okay, you have expectation here. The first case is here, and the second case is here. Okay. Why, why did I have four choose two here? number of ways that two indices can appear out of four? Yeah, like if you ask yourself what's the number of ways that IJKL can appear as like a like can be like a of the two just from two indices and appear twice, that's like a two two choose four, two four choose two, right? Like you ask like the first indices is is a let's let's say i is a like is let's say like i and i j k l only have like a a or b uh, only like this guy only looks like a or b and now you ask how many ways you can permute this thing that's like a four choose two 
So that's why you get four choose two here. The dust doesn't matter too much. What matters is that here you get this term, everything to the fourth, everything here is square. Okay. So you get this point because you use four wise independent. And now things look simple. Why? Because this thing, this is just one again. This is, and this thing, these are all one. Right? It's just minus one to the fourth, or to two, or square. So now you get that, you simplify stuff, and you get this term that looks not great, but just apply like a, this equality again, that is, the, su the sum of square, you here, like a square of the sum, how to compute that? You get like a sum of square plus the cross terms. So from this part, you get like, this is just a cross term of this, this sum, this square of the sum. Okay. And now you see that this thing and this thing would cancel out. So this is just something positive. And you have this minus three times this thing. So this part is at more zero. I just throw it away. And what you get is just this term remaining. But what is this? It's just three times norm to the fourth. So now we, we basically compute what we need to compute. And so you get that the vari variance of the variance of us expectation square. You just expand the definition and you just plug in the bar that you get that we have. That's at most two. So basically, now we are done. We complete, we complete the, the claim. OK. Question up to this point? Good. So what I'm, what, like, this thing looks a bit, like, looks like a lot of calculation. But what I want to give you now is I want to give you uh, alternative interpretation of what's going on, and I hope that this will be like this will be something that you can remember. Okay. Um, so this is just a ge geometric interpretation of what's going on. So just recall that G is just the, the vector where G i is H i, right? So it's a vector where entries are for wise independent, but you think like G is the kind of random vector of, of the form one and minus one and minus one in the entries. So if you now you look at C, C is this sum, right? Now another way to write it is just like a C is the inner product between G and X. What is inner product? means that z is the projection of x into the direction of g. That's, a, that's the, the, the geometric interpretation. So like this, imagine that I have just two dimensions instead of n dimension. Then there are like a one minus one point here. Let's say I choose one. I chose it randomly, I chose G randomly, I chose it here. Then the direction of G is like this. This is the direction of G. And let's say X is somewhere here. Then the length, like if I project X into this, this line, this is the line of G. If I project X into this line, right, then the length of this projection is just a value of the inner product between x and g. Okay. So, 
So what we have is that when you look at the length of the point as a projection, the length as a projection is the same as the length before projection. That's what it says. Okay. This is just the length of x. Oh. What is going on? One second. So what we have is that the norm of x is preserved in expectation. That's that's like uh, what's going on. Okay. And and it's not just like the norm of x is preserved. If you take let's say two points, you have two points x and x one and x two, and you project. You project x1 into g, and you get c1. And then you project x2 into g, and you get c2. You, want, you want, would also have that what is expectation of the length between the, the distance between the distance between two points as a projection. It's just the length distance between c1 and c2. Right? So what is this? This is just the absolute value of g of uh, in the product between g and c, xi minus x2. But what is this? This is just like we see that this is just norm of uh, this time between x1 and x2. So we get that the distance between x1 and x2 are pre is preserved in expectation as well. Okay. So this is kind of something that looks cool and amazing and powerful. Because you see, imagine that like this is going to be useful if you like work with big data or like uh, machine learning or something like that. Imagine that you have huge data in high dimension, right? And let's say what you care about is just like for each data point x, if you what you care about x is not where exactly it is, but the norm of it, or just the distance between any two points. If you just care about its size, the norm, or the distance between any two point, right? No matter what dimension you have, like even if it's large dimension, just imagine that you choose a random line, project all these points into this line. You reduce the dimension from n, which can be huge, to just one. And at least you know that in expectation, the distance for any two, between any two points are preserved. So this is one one conceptual message that I, I want you to, to get. It's very powerful. And okay, you get that this is this is true in expectation. Like the distance are preserved in expectation. And if you want it to be like a like a, to preserve with like with one plus epsilon factor with high probability, what you can do? We can we have an easy trick to, to make it work. Just do a median of means. Right. So 
So that's like one very good thing to know. You can reduce your big data into gen to, into line. You don't need to remember calculation we do today. I want you to remember that random projection preserve distance. Okay. I want to digress a bit because there is something even stronger that I that we can talk about random projection. So So you see that when I said that you do random projection here it's not completely random, right? Because G here is just generated by like a by a four wise independent hash, hash function. It's not really random among all all point in zero in minus one, minus one plus one. Not completely random. But even if it's not completely random, you you still get that like yeah, this time are preserved in expectation. Okay, now let me ask like. Uh, this is just digression, but I want you to know it. We will not prove anything here. What if G is completely random vector in one minus one? Okay. In other words, like each entry of like the function h here that generate G, this function h is an ideal <coughs> hash function, not just for y for y is independent. If it's just for wise independent, we saw before how to get like a epsilon estimation of a norm square using median of mean trick. Now, if this thing is completely random, I, I claim that you can get this estimation even without median of mean trick. So it turns out that just computer mean is enough. So that's like a cool thing about I will, we will not prove this because um, it's beyond the, the scope of this lecture, but it should be good to know. That is, instead of, I still ma make the same number of copies, C copies, which, which is of this order. Let's say I make copies of, of G. I get G1 up to GC. And then I, I compute C1 which is the projection of x into g1 up to zc. Okay. And then what we used to do is just we compute the median of means of this c square. Now I claim that instead, just compute the mean of c i square. That looks like this. This thing is going to be actually epsilon estimate, epsilon delta estimator already. It's just good to know, but why is that the case? Uh, we wanna like, like you can look it up. It's like the proof is not not easy anymore. But this uh, this is called Johnson Linden Stroud lemma. Um, if you do ML or something like that, you should better notice. At le but at least is the claim, is the statement clear? Like, you can you can get epsilon data estimator in even easier way, just compute the mean, not median of means. Okay. Why why do I talk even talk about this? Because it has even nicer geometric interpretation. So. Imagine that I have G, I define G to be a matrix. That looks like, basically it looks like a matrix where I put, I stack like a G together, G1 here, G2 here, up to GC. So it's a matrix of dimension with C rows and N, co N columns. Each thing here is just random one minus one. And then I scale it with, with a one over square root C. 
looks like something that is so easy to generate, right? And if you look at this matrix and compute, and then you compute the norm square after you apply apply x to g. You multiply x to g and compute its norm square. Okay. Well, that's just like a sum over each entry. There are c many entries here. Sum over i from 1 up to c. Every, every entry is square. Each entry is really just like a x times g i. And then you scale down. But that's just like you calculate, and that's 1 over c times ci square. So that's just average of ci square. So that's c square. And you, you, I claimed before that this thing is an epsilon delta estimator of norm square, right? So it means that this thing is a great estimator for norm square, which means that this is a great estimator, is a estimator of the norm. So, so what we can conclude from, from all this is that if I just sample matrix G like before, like I described, Right, it's just a like very sparse, like it's a matrix such that when you have a vector of dimension n and then you multiply it with g here, what you get is a vector of dimension just c. So it reduces the dimension from n to tiny, something tiny, just c. Okay. This is just gx. So if you generate this matrix in this simple way, given any vector x and apply this matrix, you get x theta with really tiny dimension. The dimension is just c. You get that with high probability. The norm of x theta is the same as norm of x. So is, isn't that like a cool and good to know? Like, it's like, just generate this random matrix that looks like a naive and simple. Look at any point in the, in the space of dimension n, apply it, and you get something with dimension that is independent from n. Dimension is c. The point after, like, after you brought, apply this matrix, will have the same norm. And also, like, uh, G would preserve distance as well, right? Like, if you have two points, x1, x2, compute x1 tilde and x, x2 tilde, you would get that the, norm, the distance between these two points would, would be preserved. Because you can just apply, like, just look at x1 minus x2 as one vector apply it into this, into this theorem. So, what does it mean here? It means that when you do random projection from any space of any dimension, just project it to, project it randomly into this space with kind of constant dimension. <coughs> 1 over epsilon square times log of 1 over delta. Once you do that, then the, every distance between any two points would be preserved with, with high probability. Okay. So I'm sure this is like, if you're going to work with data at some point in your career, this, this is useful.
So for example, imagine that you have n dimensional space, n you think like almost infinite, doesn't matter, right? And you have m data points that you care about. Now if you just set delta to be let's say one over m cube, so which means that the, the, the number of the C, which is like, uh, which is something like this thing, would be of order log M over epsilon square. If you apply it like this, then you would get that the distance between any pairs of points would be preserved within one plus epsilon factor with probability uh, y minus one over m. Why? Because like for each pair, you preserve it with one minus one over m, m cube probability, but there are just like m square many pairs of, the, of things. Do you, you do a union bound? You get that all pairs, the distance would be preserved for all pairs with this probability, with high probability. And you see like, doesn't matter at all what dimension you have before, but you just, if you have m data points, you just reduce it to dimension of something like log m. And basically the distance is preserved. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I want you to remember this thing. <laughs> this should be useful. Okay, but let me conclude what we have today. Um, basically, we have seen like two ways to, to estimate the, the, the norm. Think of G as a random vector. Think of G as a random vector. And you have that if you do project, if you project any point into G, like do the random projection, um, the length of projection square is the unbiased estimator of length square. So this is true, this is true in expectation. But there are like I mentioned basically two ways to make to get like a epsilon delta estimator, not just unbiased estimator. The first way that we go through the proof carefully is, is that you compute the median of means. Right? You can boost unbiased estimator to, to uh, epsilon delta estimator. And to get this thing, all you need to do is that, like you just need to make sure that G are for wise independent. And if G are for wise independent, then, then you save the space, right? Because you can generate, like G can be implicitly represented by, by a one hash function that is for wise independent. And that takes like a constant space. So that's why we use this and you have small space. And that's why it's good for streaming algorithm. Now, if you don't care much about like a saving space, if you look at the case when, when G can be completely random, you can actually get the estimator, epsilon, epsilon delta estimator, just by computing the average of copies, not, not, billion of cop, not the billion of means. Just average them. That would work too, and that's simpler, but that requires like a n-wise independent. Like that is G is completely random. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So what you what you should get from today is that random projection is is powerful. Okay. Question before we stop. Yeah, so next class is gonna be about like uh, graph sketching. 
like we're gonna use linear sketch for graph algorithm. So, so that's gonna be like last lecture on, on streaming algorithm and application. And after that, after the spring break, we're gonna look at max flow and linear program. Uh, question about exam. Okay, so we, we're gonna pause it like basically after class, after next class. And um, it should be not hard. Yeah, so wish you all the best. Yeah, <laughs> see you. <laughs>